Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we are still talking about Season 2, Episode 1, The Prodigal Son. This is Part 2 of the episode. We split it into two parts for this run. So we uh, gave it more time to be able to break down all the bits that happened in this long, feature-length episode. It originally premiered on September 27th, 1985. And I'm not going to go into the details of who directed it and who wrote it. We covered all that last week. So if you want to see the setup, who was involved with the writing and the directing of the episode and then the setup for how we got to this to this part the the climax of this story arc that was happening at the beginning of season two you can go back and check out our last episode also the first three quarters of the music was covered in that episode as well (laughs) yeah (laughs) 10 songs worth (laughs) <laughs> it was an epic track list before we get started i'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives and fans as you know last week we lost one of our regulars jenna decided to move on she had some other projects that needed her attention so she couldn't give us her her full attention to miami vice but to keep the female perspective on this show and to bring in a change where we're going to have someone who is a or a certified miami vice junkie <laughs> we're gonna bring on melissa my wife who watched these episodes when they aired yes i did this is gonna bring in a totally new perspective basically we went out and got a ringer (laughs) someone who has seen the show again and again and again we don't need to talk about how many times i've gone through the whole entire run but yes i've seen it multiple times by choice (laughs) <laughs> Someone who actually understands what's going on and can tell us when Trudy is coming back <laughs> with help. She never returns. I can tell you that. The confidence. Though. I knew it. <laughs> So this is going to be really interesting because our dynamic has been up to this point where we have three people who have never seen the show before and we're going through for the first time and our first thoughts not knowing what's coming into the future. And I think what's going to be really interesting now that we have someone who has seen the show multiple times through and seen all the lost episodes, or almost all the lost episodes. Almost all. <laughs> going to be able to kind of hint at us on like how right or wrong we are with our judgments on su- some of the future storylines. She's going to know about things that are coming up in the future. So the uh, ca- can I guess prepare us for the changes that might come down the road and then also be able to put some context into because of knowing what's happening in the future, put some context into what the characters are going through and what could be coming down the road, how it's going to set up future episodes or future story arcs you know and i think it it's also you know i know with me with my television shows i'm into the same kind of fan complaints that you know are brought up on all the fan websites it'll be interesting to hear melissa what uh with what were some of the things that fans complained about or wanted to see during the show's run yeah why they didn't what things they didn't like or did like about it Mm -hmm. and yeah be prepared to be wrong which characters did they want (laughs) Which characters were people grouping to get together and, Mm -hmm. you know, bone down? (laughs) I'm actually, what I'm most excited for is that I'm sure Melissa has years of things that she wished she had someone to talk to about Miami Vice and tell about. No one else liked Miami Vice but me. Like, I was the only one in my house that watched it. I was the only one of my friend group. I was obviously I was probably too young to be watching Miami Vice when I watched it brand new. So, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> got some got some opinions to get off the chest. Yeah, I do. I have it's lots about time for <laughs> I, I I can picture you, Melissa, sitting alone at, at uh, your only friend being Tubbs and Crockett. <laughs> Uh, Crockett, yeah. I mean, come on, it was Don Johnson. Well, we've at least replaced the Don Johnson fan of our group, too. So we have a solid Don Johnson fan. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I had his album. Does that say, what does that say about me? Uh, <laughs> I'm like a super fan or Tubbs. something. <laughs> no, I didn't have. To, I didn't know Tubbs had an album. Actually, <laughs> I was too busy listening to a Don Johnson thing <laughs> in my Walkman. <laughs> well, let's get started on this second half of the Prodigal Son. All right, guys. So I wanted to start with a brief recap of what happened in the first half. Uh, just some key points that were happening, just in case we any of us forgot 
what was happening in that first half. If you remember correctly, what happened, we started in Bogota, actually. We had a brief stint where we actually started in Colombia. And what's happening is that the Miami Vice team is trying to hunt down the Revia gang, who are making a drop somewhere in the Miami area. They ev- the Vice team does eventually figure that out. They make a bust on that in true Vice style. They murder everyone who's there trying to pick up the drugs, except for Miguel or Luis Guzman, who gets away. Because of the drug bust and the DEA is running scared from the Revia gang, all the DEA agents in New York City are hiding from the Revia gang. So they decide to volunteer the Miami Vice team, Tubbs and Crockett, and send them to New York City undercover to infiltrate the Revia gang using the drugs that they got from the bust earlier in the episode. While they're there in New York City, of course, Crockett meets a lady. Margaret, we find out that it is her name, and he spends a magical evening with Margaret, which turns into him losing his gun. We also have Valerie, who happens to be working the case of one of the drug members in New York City, and Frank Sacco. She is work- working that case undercover with the New York City vice team. And she's really working it, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's working harder trying to hide from Tubbs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, Tubbs is stalking her all over the city. And when we left off, the New York City police had finally came to the duo and said, we've had enough of you guys. You guys haven't been able to do anything. And in reality, they haven't done anything wrong. We haven't gotten to the point where the duo murders a whole bunch of people on the street in New York City. They really haven't, yes. relatively, they haven't done anything wrong yet. But the New York City police stop them and tell them, you haven't caught them yet. We're tired of your antics. And that's when Crockett decides we're going to cut off their supply. As you mentioned last week, John, the 600 kilos they got from an airplane in Florida wasn't going to cut off their supply enough. They're going to cut off their supply, then force the Revia gang to buy from them. And that brings us up to current. Yes. And so we're about to go on a rampage a little bit uh, <laughs> what else towards the end of the episode. The very first scene kind of just sets the tone for the second half of the episode. You start out with the team uh, kind of calling out Penn Gillette's character for kind of running them around and preventing them from selling anything. The the Revia gang had been blocking Jimmy from supplying. They they made it clear to Jimmy. The Revia gang made made it clear to Jimmy that to make sure that the Americans weren't able to move their drugs on the street of New York. But the duo have been pushing hard, and that's what's happening here at Club Delirious. Is they are telling him like we will give you half of our haul if you're able to help us bring down how the Revia gang gets their drugs into New York City. While they're sitting having this conversation, it very quickly turns into a gunfight when the Colombians show up. We get a little bit of special effects failure. I don't know <laughs> if you guys noticed. No, I didn't. You know, all, The one thing I noticed is that clearly no one can hit anybody. It's like a stormtrooper shootout. Yeah, no one could aim. <laughs> so let me describe Crockett's gun battle with the uh, with one of the Colombians. It shows Crockett pull his gun out of his uh, his angle gun out, and he shoots. And it shows the Colombian guy behind the wall. He jumps out in the doorway and shoots and jumps back in the doorway. We go back to Crockett shooting. We go back to the doorway. We go back to Crockett shooting. We go back to the doorway, and then all of a sudden, like six bullets hit the doorway. <laughs> Like so magic. either these are the slowest bullets on the planet or Crockett's the terrible shot and it took him like two minutes to finally hit something close. <laughs> well, maybe they were trying to do that because she had his gun, right? So that's mm. like his backup gun that he keeps in his ankle. So maybe they were trying to point out like he didn't have his regular gun because he had to go down to his ankle to get it out. And they made a, they made like a point to show that because he still didn't have his gun back at that point. So maybe that's what that was about. Like he's that a bad a, shot with his ankle, right? His ankle. That is a massive gun for a gun that he keeps on his, his ankle. ankle. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's like a regular gun. Why are you keeping that giant thing on your ankle? <laughs> okay, got it. So he's just threw him off having to go to the backup gun. <laughs> yeah, because like, you can tell initially he tries to go to his regular gun, but then he has to go down to his ankle. I mean, he goes back with his ankle, and then like he misses, and it's like, Crockett's not supposed to miss. He murders people on the first shot. Like That's how this works. So maybe, that, I don't know, shots maybe that's what he was doing. That's what they were showing. Like, look, he has, to, he has to use his backup gun, so he's not as good with his backup gun. <laughs> or his bullets are really slow. No, I don't know. <laughs> Damn you bringing common sense to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the end of the shootout, the duo was able to bring down the assassins, I guess you could say, from the Revia gang. And immediately, G- Jimmy tells them they pay $1,500 a drop. It's out at Jackson Heights. He immediately confesses after he sees the shootout, knowing, like, I am in such harm's way. I want to be on the duo's team. 
and not on the Revia side because the Revias are obviously out to get me. We jump from there and go to, I have her listed as the bar woman because we hadn't <laughs> learned her name yet. We find out here that her name is Margaret. And so Sonny's showing up at Margaret's house. The, if you remember from the first half, is the woman that he shacked up with that he met at Club he Delirious. shacked up with some scandalous <laughs> And he's only there to pick up his gun. He he came to talk to her. He's very upset. He wants his gun back. She's having like a big party at the house. She just walks up into into our bedroom, which is her house has a very strange layout. And then just gets like a purse from behind her so, pillow and hands him his gun. Yeah, exactly. And then he tells her it's not cool. It's not cool, <laughs> Margaret. Not cool. Says, yeah, it's exactly. uncool. Yeah, uncool. uncool. There you go. Yeah. Uncool, lady. Uncool. Yeah. That was like a scathing <laughs> remark from him. That's the the scariest that he could be. <laughs> I, I wrote down the actual quote. It's, that was major uncool. <laughs> oh my God, that's so 80s. Major uh, uncool. I just, Lady. So I love these building block shaped holes in her wall. So there's like a triangle hole here and then like a rectangle uh, hole here and then a like circle here. And I just love at the end of Crockett saying, how uncool she is, <laughs> doing a little flirting, and then he leaves. And then there's this creepy guy just leaning into one of the holes, like eavesdropping on the whole thing. And he, he's like, oh, you're slowing a bit, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, and it's the same guy that they were making comments when Tubbs, I mean Tubbs, when Crockett was asleep in her bed, and they were yeah. like moving in paintings. It's the same guy. Yeah, it's the same. It's creepy. That guy's creepy. I think he has a thing for Crockett. I think that's, that was yeah. that's why he was leaving in the hole, hoping something was going to happen. He was going to start leaving in the hole. And then he watched. <laughs> Maybe that's why she has those holes there. Maybe she's like really kinky. And she's like people watching. Oh, I think that was insinuating well, how quickly yeah, she uh-huh. threw the heat at him when she was when they were at the bar. But she's uncool, though. So. <laughs> I put down that uh, I was betting that she took his badge this time. <laughs> <laughs> when we leave from Margaret's house, we jump over to Valerie's house this time. So there's a lot in here where Tubbs and Crockett are at separate locations. They're they're actually as equal together as they are apart in this episode. Where normally they're inseparable, right? They're always next to But in this episode, they're they're apart a lot of the episode i question repeatedly throughout the episodes like is there actual police work happening here or are they just on a new york city vacation hey they can do both okay you know <laughs> i like i am so with you on this because i actually have a little bit later here in the breakdown when they actually do a little bit of police work i said <laughs> finally some police work uh in between their vacation <laughs> yeah yeah i mean they're at this point because they're that's just running down like- trying to fix all the shit they fucked up in the first half. Hey, they've murdered a bunch of people already. So that's, they've, they've done their job. In the beginning of this episode, they've already killed like two or three people. Mm-hmm. True. They're ahead of the game. That was their police work. Now they can go hang out. And... They weren't trying to kill anyone. Those people just burst in and shot at them. Yeah, I mean, so what are you far, to do? So far, all they've actively done in this episode is try and get laid. <laughs> True. They are good at that, though. So that's part of their job. They were doing their undercover getting laid, I guess. I don't know. When we get over to Valerie's house, it's just Tub, like, stalking. Tub's just stalking around. Sorry. Just Tub. <laughs> singular just tub. a singular Tub. <laughs> <laughs> he's just stalking around Valerie's house and then he, he goes and knocks on the door and she is not happy to see him at, being there at all and he brings up I've been trying to call you and she flips on the answer machine which has like an actual switch like a dial that have to, yes, they have to dial it over and the messages just start playing you hear it's like he's, he's left like 50 desperate me- <laughs> messages Valerie this is Tom again <laughs> <laughs> I miss you <laughs> But this this goes downhill for a candle. <laughs> this goes downhill for Tubbs real fast because he, when he walks in, he looks <laughs> at her bed and he immediately starts insinuating with her that she's sleeping with Frank, and she admits it. She says, "I have to do whatever's necessary to bring this case in." She starts saying that she's just in so deep she has to do whatever it takes and then Tubbs throws some shade back at her and it's like does that mean turning tricks for him (laughs) yeah so basically she keeps saying no means no and so he gets mad and calls her a whore yeah that's essentially it that's no that's that's not (laughs) i think that's a little bit (laughs) no she said in that scene she talked about how she liked that 
what what is his name? Frank. Frank. How she likes Frank, and he treats her good. Like even though she's doing her job. He said she. He, he said she was worse than her sister because at least her sister was upfront about being a whore. <laughs> that is true. He did, say, he did say that, but that had nothing to do with like he wasn't going to get any. He was just saying like, what are you doing? Remember in the beginning of the conversation, he talked about how you haven't checked in too. Like, no one knows where you're at either. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. they don't know where you're at. So it's like almost like she's off doing this on her own. Like, is she really doing this undercover or has she gotten in too deep? And now she's like, just had a thing. Yeah, she doesn't know how to get out now. She doesn't know how to get out. Mm -hmm. And so she's just like going with it. I think that's what he was going with. Apparently, Tubbs knows where she's at. Well, yeah, because he follows her around like a stalker. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'm not saying that's right, but I don't think he (laughs) was. No, I mean, I get it. I get it. And later on, she pops up and screws things up later. So I see what she. Yeah, and she. Only thing she asked in this scene of note that is, she just asked Tubbs to understand. Officer to officer. I'm doing my job. You have to, like, give me. Like leeway to do my job. Just mm-hmm. understand, I have to do what I have to do, basically. Yeah, and Tubbs just says, and, and, "I may not understand later." Yeah, but like Tubbs can talk. Like all the stuff Tubbs has done and yeah, but, undercover. Yeah, but he, Gina, and Crockett are the two that have gone too far while undercover. Tubbs is the uh, one. That's... No, Tubbs. What, remember in the McCarthy, the Great McCarthy race, where mm-hmm. he slept with that girl who ended up being the murderer? How was that not too far? <laughs> He's just a lover. <laughs> it's not because he gets in too um, deep. What about sleeping with Calderon's daughter? <laughs> and that wasn't Tubbs. And I that wasn't. Gave away, that wasn't I gave away a big That wasn't Ricardo Tubbs. <laughs> That, that was the Jamaican Ricardo. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I almost totally gave away a big, huge... And Jamaican Ricardo like, does what he wants. <laughs> well, clearly. I mean, he seduced a school teacher, for God's sake. <laughs> All I can see someone having vast knowledge about Miami Vice is really going to pay off. <laughs> just started throwing uh, down uh, episodes like <laughs> what about, listen what about that like oh shit i can't even remember the uh, most yeah. of the episode names <laughs> <laughs> when we're done with valerie's house we go back to margaret's house and it's the morning and of course sunny stayed and he slept with margaret again because he can't help himself he's such a lover God, he's such an he's, idiot he's <laughs> such a bleeding heart he stayed with her again and that's what i wrote down is there any actual police work going on anymore but this time it's sorry it's not, it's not it's not the next morning it's like the middle of the night and margaret's mm-hmm. on the phone he, that's when crockett, the the <laughs> yeah, crockett throws yeah, open a little tiny door in, on the wall in the hallway the looking through. through the uh, big <laughs> hole in the wall <laughs> She says she merely hangs up when when she sees that Crockett comes out. He asks her about it. She says it's just business uh, and that life keeps throwing her little surprises. And this is when Sonny, Sonny, man, this is when he tells her, like, I like oh. you more than normal and I want to be oh, honest God. with you. It's like, dude, you've oh, known her God. for like 48 hours. Dude, I, I, my exact note was Crockett must practice this stuff because he just goes out and throws out the game. <laughs> I think he's serious. He's just got the worst taste in women ever. All I could think about was that so, he was wearing that robe. Hopes. Like, whose mm-hmm. robe is that? Like, what did he have a robe there for? She, it's just some man's robe. He's wearing like a man's robe that she has all these men over, and they just wear that same thing. Like, like here, I have this robe. That it's he free brought it with him. It's part of his one night stand kit. <laughs> it's all folded up neatly. <laughs> uh, so, so he goes out and he lays all on her, and then she rightly questions, "Is your last name Barnett?" Your phone number really five 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 five. You know all these lies he keeps spitting at her. And he's like, "Nah, baby, it's cool." It's not that, but I can't tell you what it is. But I want to tell you, I'm not a bad guy. I'm not one of those. What did he say? He's not one of those. Like she, like she just said, she was into bad guys. Like mm-hmm. I mean, these guys that do bad things. And he's like, "Well, I mean, I do bad things, but I do it for a reason, and I don't like doing it." Basically, the only thing that he gives away is she asks him if his name's really Burnett, and he, he says. says no. His name's really Sunny. Yeah, exactly. Just, so, just not Brandon. Which, in reality, his name really isn't Sunny. His first name is James. I know. So, so whatever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I mean, he, he, he's lied so much to women at this point, he can't even remember which, which is, is truth anymore. Which is why he just uses his real name, because I think he can't remember. He would be terrible at remembering a new name. <laughs> not like, well, I mean, Ricardo uses the same <laughs> one, too, actually, huh? Ricardo Cooper. <laughs> Or Ricardo so, Tubb, as we call him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we make a new name. No. <laughs> so now we actually get to some police work. Now. Yes. Yeah, we actually get some police work. Tubbs and Crockett are going to go investigate the information that Jimmy gave them on how 
the Revia gang gets the drugs. And so they're out parked at like long, at the dock. Like, yeah, I mean, out, like, like a dock. Along the river. Mm-hmm. I mean, or, yeah. Or something. There's like a brief con- con- conversation before the uh, drugs swim up on shore a la <laughs> sea otter. But the, the <laughs> there's two things to note is that Tubbs asks Sonny if, if he can meet Margaret. Yeah. And then Sonny asks Tubbs, are you going to stay in New York? Because obviously now no, that- uh, Crockett's getting a little concerned that his best friend's forever buddy is going to stay in New York City now that he's back in his home on his home turf. Yeah, he's going to rejoin New York robbery. <laughs> Where they don't even if want him. Was, <laughs> they don't want but, even want well, him I'm there. Just saying, he must not have been very popular. I haven't seen him talk to one other cop that's like, hey, Ricardo, good to see you back. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, they don't want him there. They're like, get out of here. The New York Police Department's like, we don't want you here. You, you're not doing any good here. We don't need your help. So he must not mm-hmm. have been a very good policeman while he was there. Or he just burned the bridges so bad by doing all that lying he did in the very beginning, like in the pilot episode and all that, where he said he was his brother and all that. Mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. he did secretly. Mm-hmm. It, okay, so let me tell you, this guy that comes swimming up with the coke, he earns his money, man. I mean, he must he, he must have swam all the way there from Jersey. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Where did he come from? <laughs> <laughs> Out of nowhere, in the just black comes- water, mm-hmm. uh, up comes a guy wearing full scuba gear. Mm-hmm. And he just he swims bag with up, him and he's got a bag a with him. Bag. And it's got the cocaine, which is actually a surprisingly little amount of cocaine for being the cocaine kingpins of New York City. And he just gets out of the water, walks up to a car, puts the bag in the car, and drives away in his full scuba gear in the car. Yeah, all I can think about is he's sitting with that scuba tank on his back while he sits in that car. He didn't take that off. He just put it in the trunk and then got in. Like wearing, the, envisioning him wearing the is, scuba mask. Is he still breathing? I know. Is he still breathing the oxygen? Is he going to get the bends? Yes. So the duo follows just him. Just down the street. <laughs> Out the window. <laughs> Goggles fogging up. I don't have time to change. I have to get out of here. <laughs> so he takes the coke to the least secure location he can find. Yeah, they follow him straight to the drop point. And in a bright yellow convertible mm-hmm. right behind him and they park right across the street from him so he can see that i mean how is he fo- how are they following him secretly is that what well, that was secretly following him <laughs> how did he not just look at them in his scuba mask and go like there they are <laughs> they're following me why is that yellow convertible following me <laughs> it's really hard to see in goggles <laughs> true yeah they were you all fucked up <laughs> just add mirrors and things get complicated so uh, of course after um, just gonna call him the mule after the mule makes his drug drop at the building Tubbs and crockett go to steal that drop that way they could pinch the revia gang and, st- and steal their drugs that they're going to sell on the street there they come prepared they're, they're able to quickly at break this in. point at this point i'm wondering why uh, I, Tubbs gets out a pair of lock cutters and a can of gas and i'm thinking what the hell is the gas for yeah you know and i have some questions of what happens next too because i i didn't notice the gas can um so they're able to quickly get into the building they steal the trucks they run out and they drive away they secretly get away in their convertible no one will ever know who stole the drugs <laughs> and then as they drive away the building explodes it explodes like it got hit by a missile mm-hmm. it 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 takes down the entire it would take down the entire block that's how big that yeah, explosion it's definitely was definitely more than that one house i mean mm-hmm. i don't know if they're supposed to be abandoned yeah. or whatever because they're all graffitied on but crockett and, crockett and tubs just down harlem but, i mean how did they know that there wasn't somebody in there or like the, attached to that apartment or mm-hmm. whatever that thing is like that can cops even burn things down <laughs> no like, I don't undercover think so. or not i don't think so I mean, i'm pretty think sure they're not allowed to light fires. <laughs> Yeah, let alone burn down an entire neighborhood in the ghetto. And I, I, now that I know that, now that you said, John, that they brought in a gas can, how does a gas can produce that kind of explosion? They had to have something more than just gas, right? They had to have actual explosives. I know, it was barely know. five <laughs> gallons. So um, other th- the only other thing I can think is that the dumbasses poured a gas can to try and just light the place on fire, and then, like, a gas line exploded. I also don't understand why they needed to blow the building why did up. They need it up? Why didn't they just take the drugs? I didn't understand that either. Yeah, they, they accomplished that mission. The drug drop is probably someone who they've muscled to allow them to use that, that building, so they just punished some random person, person in yeah. New York City. The fact that the guy goes in that building, no one watches 
from the drugs uh, means that you probably won't know they're even gone for hours until someone finally stumbles around to pick them up. I don't know. It was it was a very weird how that ended, but it, but it did end up working. Because the next morning we see at the Revia house, Miguel and Esteban are there meeting with their with their other cronies in their house. Esteban, who is also Calderon, as if we're oh, not supposed to notice we're not supposed that. To know he's got sunglasses on and different hair. <laughs> Esteban says, "Get them together, set up a meeting. That way they can get the drugs from the Americans." So it turns out their plan worked, but as we know, that's cu- coming up. It didn't work the way that they had hoped it worked because then Frank ends up finding out and then puts a hit out on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I got more caught up with the next scene with Tubbs and Crockett on the roof with all the New York cops. And the New York cops are telling them, like, you guys are fucking nuts. You're blowing up buildings. And <laughs> Crockett's like, I'm out of order. You're out of order. The whole system's <laughs> out of order. Yeah, they do not actually defend themselves, like, like give a good reason why they did it. They're just like, we had to do it because we had nothing else to do. This is the only way we could do it. You weren't helping us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so they're, me- they're meeting with Commander You see, Renee. in Miami, we have blow things up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, how bad is it that you're worse than the New York <laughs> Police Department, like, as far as crime goes? Like, you you took it too far than New York City. But I, I love, yeah, I love how that's their argument. Well, I don't know about you guys in New York, but in Miami, me like this stuff is okay well it, i mean clearly it is because they murder everybody and blow crap up all the time so. <laughs> even out of their jurisdiction <laughs> even in other countries <laughs> i mean that that's what called their own was right yeah Actually, that was another country that is going to shoot it up <laughs> and this this meeting you know it's with commander renee and the same lieutenant that the vice team has been working with at the local precinct Sorry. whatever lieutenant precinct. mustache they are pissed mm-hmm. at how it's going obviously we know they blew up the building there's some there's people <laughs> you know, dead around all over new york <laughs> commander renee uh, uh, string of dead bodies they left behind <laughs> certain rules don't apply like burning down buildings or killing people our duo sticks to like, hey, we're doing what it takes to bring these guys down. Commander Renee saying, you're going way above and beyond what is legally allowed. Uh, and he drops a line that's great. He says, you're out. You're over and out. <laughs> In his purple suit and then walks away with his ball cut. <laughs> In the end, what this scene ends up meaning is that the New York City police aren't going to help Tubbs and Crockett. They are on their own. They're not going to get the SWAT team. They're not going to yeah, help them out with their pickup. The drugs that they need. That they're supposed to which, produce. Which is completely fine because Thompson Crockett are apparently very, very good crooks. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> we don't need that. No. After the rooftop, yeah. we, we have a... Murder, murder people and blow stuff up all by themselves. <laughs> After the hotel meeting, or the not hotel, the rooftop meeting, we have a brief scene that's an important one, though, where we see, we jump to the street and we see Frank Sacco's limo pull up and both Valerie and Frank get out. And then Frank goes walking across like a courtyard. He goes to meet up with a group of people and Valerie stays back at the limo. We see that when Frank comes walking up, he's meeting, one of the people he's meeting with is Margaret. And so now we see how deep... Dun, dun, dun. Now we see. Yeah. We see how far the net stretches, how many people are involved, and how unlikely it is that Frank Sacco and the Revia gang don't know, which actually is surprising the Revia gang don't know, but Frank knows, and so does a lot of people in New York City, that Tubbs and Crockett are cops. After this quick scene, we go <laughs> back to Jimmy's place, and this is when Tubbs and Crockett go check back in with Jimmy. They went and they followed up on his lead. He was able to get them to a person and see the scene where they can go pinch the drugs from the Revia gang, so they go to see jimmy at his like apartment loft kind of thing that he has and i'm sure we have lots to say about <laughs> jimmy's loft that thing was it's, like a pepto well, he's dead, on the wall. <laughs> yeah well that's true he's dead <laughs> <laughs> i was blown away it was like i i mentioned in our pre-show it was it's like the movie big but the peewee playhouse version yeah like something, <laughs> i don't uh-huh. even know Clearly, it, I mean, he must have a lot of money, right? Mm-hmm. Let's get that straight. Like, to have that big of a place in New York. Okay, so if you have so much money, why did you paint the walls pink? Why do you have a train table with, like, some <laughs> weird things on it? Like, toys set up on there or something that Crockett was looking at? Yeah, they're not even... And the I, walls aren't even regular walls. They're just, like, false walls that are spread out throughout the lot. It's, like, half walls all mm-hmm. over the place. Like, 
I'm going to make my own cubicles all in my, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think the better question in this scene is, how is Tubbs not dead? Also, um, how come Crockett didn't see the blood trail while he was playing with those toys? Like, you could see that where the elevator is, and then all of a sudden it opens, and then there's Jimmy in there. Like, how come he didn't see the blood trail that went, like, it's like a big, long line? <laughs> <laughs> it must be the same thing with, as the backup weapon. He didn't have the right sunglasses on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Throw them off. <laughs> but no, during the firefight, guy appears out of nowhere with, with a machine gun, and Crockett yells, uh, Tubbs, look out. And then, like, Tubbs sits there, like, with his arms over his face for like two minutes and then finally Crockett shoots the guy and it's like like how did the guy with the machine gun not just murder Tubbs? I have no idea. And and that's what I mentioned earlier. It's like the Revia gang, the muscle or in this case is Frank it's Frank Sacco's men, they can't hit anything. No, it's like, yeah, it's like comical Mm -hmm. how bad it is. They're worse than Crockett with his backup gun. Yeah, so Crockett's able to take out a few people, and then they just take off running. They they, they hit the street, and Tubbs and Crockett split up, and so, well, I only thought there was two people in that wall. I think they were waiting down in the Mm. bottom of the building. Yeah, because then four people come running out of the apartment building and go chasing out. They split up two and two, two go chasing after Crockett, two go chasing after Tubbs. Tubbs does some... That's hilarious. They just start, they just run away. (laughs) Oh, shit. Start running. (laughs) The two that chase after Tubbs, Tubbs does some, like, switcheroo magic on the street, like New York City street (laughs) magic on him. He waits for a truck to drive up. He is able to grab one of them from one side of the truck, and when the truck leaves, he shoots and kills the other person that's, that's, that's chasing him. And then the guy that he has in the headlock does like the most comical pass out. Yeah, it was like something, oh, it was really bad acting is what it was. And he like shakes his head like, ah, ah. And, yeah. and then Tub said something like it was too much for him. Yeah. Like, okay. He says too much excitement. Yeah, too much excitement. The guy just passed right out. Uh, it was like a cartoon pass out. Like a mm-hmm. Tom and Jerry like style. Like an anvil and hit, him, hit him on the head and he was like, he melted down. Uh-huh. <laughs> the better one though, <laughs> in, in my opinion, yeah, is that the two that are chasing Crockett, Crockett goes into like full the U football and just outruns his, he just. Well, I mean, that's what he did, right? Like, yeah. He played football in college. So. He just sets his pace and he's gone. Yeah, he like really force shows. gumps it out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he really shows why he got that college scholarship to Florida. <laughs> Which, right. by the way, Dom, he he was a Gator, not a, a Hurricane. Oh, yeah. that's true. He, he played in Florida. Florida not, yeah, yeah, that's not true. He was a Gator. He was a Florida Gator. That's true. That makes more sense. That makes that makes sense of why he didn't go pro. Um, <laughs> hey, he went to Vietnam. Yes. That's um, why he didn't go also, pro. why he's a little bit more redneck, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, comfortable in the swamps. Yeah. <laughs> After they're able to, to kind of ditch the people that are trying right. to kill them, <laughs> they yeah. ran away. we jump over to Valerie's place. Okay. Tubbs just goes and bangs on Valerie's door. Then when she opens it, he rips her out and just starts yelling at her like, I, I, I'm, I'm a little confused by this. Does Tubbs murder Valerie's boyfriend? Is that what happens in this scene? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that I is think. what happened. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, I, 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 I was oh. struggling with that. Like, did he, did he just murder her boyfriend? He yeah. did. <laughs> yeah, he's. So I don't know if he, he grabs him. Valerie and pulls her out of the of the apartment. I don't know why he's not thinking that Frank wouldn't be there. I don't know. I think he was just really mad because he thought that she gave him up. When I wish start. I could quit you. <laughs> what was that? Like, I wish I could quit you. <laughs> <laughs> The, he pulls her out and starts yelling at her like, how did Frank know? Give me the information. And she's just yelling back at him like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any, any information. And then Frank comes out like in his Hugh Hefner. I, like, I thought that was like he was wearing her robe. <laughs> I was like, is he wearing her robe? What is going on with the men wearing these robes in this episode? <laughs> and he just casually pulls a gun out. And then Tubbs just just screams, Rampage! And then runs into the apartment and shoots and kills Frank. And that's the end yes. of Frank. <laughs> That was kind of an anticlimactic <laughs> way to get rid of him, isn't it? Like, you should think they could have got more information out of him alive, but hey. Yeah. The I important don't thing here is what Tubbs and Valerie talk about. Va- Valerie's in shock. She's like, what have you done? You've blown this whole thing wide open. Like, that's going to yeah. be and she picks up retribution. The gun yeah. And points she, it at him and mm-hmm. says, like, you messed up. Look what you've done, basically. And Tubbs 
asks her, like, how long has this investigation been going on? She says two, maybe three years. And then he accuses her of, like, you've been intentionally dragging this out because, because you, you like care him. for Frank. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, not to mention, you know how hard it is to get blood out of carpet? <laughs> yeah. She's uh, going to be cleaning up that spot for weeks. <laughs> Not to mention it ruined her perfectly good bathrobe that he was wearing. <laughs> she So at the end of the scene, Val, Valerie picks up the gun, picks up Frank's gun, and tells Tubbs to get out and tells him to go talk to Margaret. Yeah, because Margaret the, is mm-hmm. who the, is she who knows – she knows Frank, basically. And we have a brief scene. It's not really important. We just see that Crockett calls Tubbs, and Tubbs tells him, we got to talk an about Margaret. Scene. He was brooding. He was waiting for <laughs> Margaret to show up. He was looking at other women with similar hairstyles at the bar, and they were not her, and he was sad. And then he was like, the only thing I can do is go call my best friend. And then I call my best friend, and my best friend has terrible news for me. <laughs> I mean – how could that scene be like, ah, that scene wasn't important. Let's we'll go right over that. Damn your Miami Vice. <laughs> uh, I, I love that conversation, though. We got to talk about Margaret. Not, I just killed someone. Yeah, yeah, never mind that. I killed Frank would have been the first thing you should come out. We need to talk about Margaret because she's out of control. Yeah, I killed Frank in my ex-girlfriend's apartment. Never mind the fact that she was sleeping with him and all the other stuff that was going on. <laughs> so we go to Margaret's house and the duo shows up there. And obviously she's not happy to see them. They're not happy with her. Uh, Sunny is particularly broken up with not how... cool uncool lady uncool <laughs> i wrote down he's got his uh, disappointed dad look going on it's <laughs> so disappointed i know how he's just he's he's mad at her because she lied better than he did basically yeah because he lies about everything so <laughs> he's like you're not supposed to lie i'm the liar <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what that's but i will say i was i was disappointed to find out she was just a corporate spy I was hoping she was like some kind of hitman that was supposed to kill him. Yeah, I have to say too, I'm disappointed. I mentioned last week that that was this was the storyline I was most interested in. I thought for sure the storyline was going to be that she stole the gun because she really wanted to kill somebody, and now there's blood with that gun that Crockett has to somehow solve, and she's gonna because Sonny fell for her. He would try and defend her, but no, it just turns out that she's some corporate. She sleeps with men to get information from and then sells that information to gangs or rival businesses and stuff like that. And that's all that she does. She doesn't know who the information goes to. Uh, She's purposefully kept out of the loop. The only thing she's able to do is she gives them a business card, which ends up being for this executive last name Johnston. It's like Jay Johnston. Uh, Jay Jay Johnston. Yeah, Jay Jay Johnston generic business card. Like, uh, okay. <laughs> so, and that's, of course, that's where we go next. The duo goes straight to a high rise in New York. We have a very long, like, a, a moving scene of the camera panning up to this really tall Yeah, they really building. wanted you to know they were in New York. Like, yeah. we're really in New York. We're not oh, using and, and, stock footage. <laughs> and we get a little bit of the yellow Cadillac with uh, Jan Hammer really getting down. Um <laughs> Uh, with some mu- transition music. <laughs> of course, the duo just barges right into his office. Johnston tells his secretary to beat it. And he then proceeds to go through and talk about all the information he knows about Tubbs and Crockett, their names, where they're from, where they went to school. But he spends the whole time pacing back and forth, staring out different sections of the window. But we clearly just got the sense that they're on like 40th floor. So I don't know what he's looking at. As he looks yeah. out the window and I paces mean, around back and forth. So, can I just read you guys my notes as the scene progressed? Crockett has a history of being a dick to secretaries. <laughs> Undercover investigation out the window. Tubbs credit sucks. Uh, American Express <laughs> turned him down. <laughs> Someone shoot him, please. So, America needs drug dealers to repay loans. Yeah, so it basically boil- all boils down to that U.S. banks have loaned Latin countries money and the only way they can get their money back is if they can sell the only good that they manufacture in their country which happens to be drugs according at least to this businessman that's the only thing they can do that they, they can sell the drugs in the u.s so they let it happen and they need the police to get out of the way and ricardo Tubbs has terrible credit 
and no money in the bank either. He only had one hundred and thirty six dollars yeah. in his bank account. <laughs> Crockett had. I wonder 600. if it was awkward when he when he he announced how much money Sonny had, and then he went to Tubbs. Like, yeah, I know. American <laughs> Express won't give you a credit card. Visa won't give you a credit card. <laughs> And Tubbs is like, well, my album didn't do well. It produced very many hits. <laughs> Once again, Croc is better than you. <laughs> this, the only important thing here is that... This guy really likes to drink water yes. slowly and enjoy the view of the water so, in the glass. <laughs> so I, I did want to talk a little bit about this particular scene because not only have we talked about Margaret being a corporate spy is a bit of a letdown. Her involvement gets even more minimized when you take into account that this character who was clearly supposed to be reoccurring in later episodes um, yeah, because he JJ mentions, Johnson yeah because he mentions that they can't bring him down because he's because t- he, too tight yeah. into politics yeah. and stuff like that but eventually they will Mm-hmm. Like Crocker said, like I will get you eventually. That's the end of it. Yeah, he says. It. He says, "quote But you're dirty, yeah. Ace, and I'm patient." Yeah. So Julian Bex, who plays the, uh, who's the actor who plays J.J. Johnson, actually died of stomach cancer 13 days before this episode aired. And so, any chance of them going back to this storyline or to this character uh, basically died with him. Yeah, and you know, knowing ever budget conscious Miami Vice, who knows how many stories they had him penned for. Yeah, but you know, I mean, I think with them, they, they wouldn't hesitate to put a new person in the role either, knowing them. Like, I mean, the, the fact that they bring other actors back, they're different people, like Izzy. <laughs> like, you know, I'd rather bring back this person who was a main character in this episode, but pretend like you don't know that's Calderon with a wig on and sunglasses. <laughs> so, I mean, they might, maybe they just didn't like that story. Maybe that storyline just didn't go anywhere. They, they, they could have redone it, you know, like reprised it with a different person. And who who's to say that, that back then, I would I probably wouldn't have known the difference. I probably would have been like, oh, some skinny old man. Okay. <laughs> I would have known. <laughs> so, uh, before we get to our final scene where we get to the Revia meetup. Well, sorry, it's not our final scene. We have a couple short scenes that are after the meetup slash massacre that the Vice team throws down on the Revia gang. We have a short montage which just shows Crockett, Tubbs, and Valerie doing some thinking time. They're just getting doing ready. Some, they're doing some deep thinking, getting ready. And then we head over to the meetup. The ent- it looks like the entire Revia gang is waiting for them at a park. Is that a park that, that they're meeting at? A business park, maybe? I don't know. It looks like they come yeah, out of it. I mean, based, well, based on all the altercations that they've had, all the murdering of uh, and, and attempted murder that they've had between the two, this actually starts out as a somewhat civil meet. True, it does. I mean, they... they... They actually do business. They actually, try. Yeah, they, they, they try to do business. It would have been a, a successful trade. They walk up, they hand Revia. They both put down their briefcases. Revia opens up his brief, briefcase of money. The duo tries to open up their briefcase of drugs, but Miguel comes over and steps on it and says, I don't know what's inside. They're obviously real leery of Tubbs and Crockett, but that's also because they've murdered so many people in New York City well, since probably, they've been there. And they're probably leery because they're, they're cops, you know, and this is a, a drug deal. But, you know, at least that, that would make me leery. <laughs> um, yeah, but I don't know that they know that they're cops, though. Like, if they know they're cops, I, they just I think at this them. point, everyone in New York knows they're cops. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, everyone, you know, it's the obvious people, but these are the people that scuba dived right, and got their, <laughs> their drugs. Uh, um, also, I think that they, so, that, that Tubbs and uh, Crockett had a feeling that they were planning on killing them. So that's why they were like, because when they walk out, they're like, okay, there's this many people. Make sure you can shoot them all. Mm-hmm. So that's why they were, the Rivera's went there and they were never planning on doing business with Crockett and Tubbs. They were going to kill them and take the drug, which is why what happened I, with Valerie. I don't know about that. Before we find out, exactly, Valerie shows yeah, up and exactly. F's it all up. Is Valerie there to help them, or is she there to shoot Tubbs for killing Frank? I think she's there to help them. After her thinking, uh, time, after her thinking she, time, she decides that after looking at the broken the picture, picture of her oh, and yeah. Tubbs, and her sister, right? Mm-hmm. That one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That she decides to go help them, and she's the only New York City police officer that shows up to yeah. their so aid. She goes to help so. them, and I think she knows that they're going to be killed. So she goes there and just like blurts out or whatever, and yells out, and then and then that's when it all starts. And then this is another scene where I question whether who does the lessons for how to shoot in New York City because the duo are standing directly in the middle. They're surrounded. 
in a circle by the Ravia gang. Valerie yells out and fires a couple shots, and then the duo is able to jump out of the way without being hit as there's hundreds of bullets flying around in the I air. Know, right? It's like slow motion, too. The bullets are going slow motion. And, and, even, though, even though the Ravia gang outnumbers them, they still decide to run away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Revia gang just hit. They start. They spread out. They 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 mm-hmm. start running away. They're able to. The duo and Valerie are able to take down every single one of them, though, except for Esteban, who goes running for a helicopter, and Sunny chases after him. Yeah, Valerie and the, Tubbs um, do like a Charlie's Angel type back to back shootout, and be able mm-hmm. to take down the entire Re- Revia gang. Wait, let me tell you, this just shows how dumb their henchmen are. At one point, they kill one guy, and then another guy runs out and stands. Exactly where the last guy was yes, right, right where it was and then he goes over and, and, and they shoot same kill way. him <laughs> yeah. Esteban goes running he um, makes it all the way to a waiting helicopter uh, who, that's already running he jumps in the helicopter starts to fly away and then Sonny just stops Vietnam style takes a knee and, and puts three or four bullets into that helicopter. The helicopter flies a few with hundred feet. With a handgun. Feet. Yes, with a handgun. That's yeah. realistic, though, you know. <laughs> yeah. The helicopter flies a few a hundred feet away, stops, turns around, comes back on its way back, crashes and explodes, shooting paper all over the field. <laughs> Into a fiery ball of paper, because apparently when metal explodes, it becomes paper. <laughs> First of all, handgun being greater than helicopter is surprising, but I think that's that's probably why you buy American. You know, if you bought an American helicopter, that would have never happened. <laughs> Well, I mean, the foreign ones are just stuffed with paper. That's all that was in the inside of it. <laughs> there wasn't even really an engine. It was just all full of copy paper. So now at this point, they have murdered the entire Revia gang and probably most of the Frank Sacco gang. The duo is now ready to head back to Miami after massacring the entire cocaine drug ring I mean, in New York City. Those people were going to die anyway. <laughs> They were living the life of danger anyways. They were going to die. They just they just sped it up a little bit. Oh. Hey, those people tried to shoot at them first. <laughs> we have two scenes before, before we close out to the end of this episode. The first scene, of course, it's time for se- it's sexy time. <laughs> Both oh. Tubbs and Crockett are boning down with their ladies at the same time. Oh, okay. That, that separate sounds from wrong. each other. Yeah, okay. That, that, that sounds yeah. bad. <laughs> but there's <laughs> like, a lot oh. of foot rubbing. I, know, I was picturing them like high five and then stuff. Yeah, oh, God. Gross. <laughs> okay. I think we need to discuss the foot, the foot stuff. Like, what is with the sex scenes and they rub their feet together? Like, is that a thing or something? But I mean, is that like some kind of of, like secret message they were trying to give Especially out. Especially when they something? stick their feet up in the they air the, in and the then air, they rub yeah. their feet together. And then, and, like feet are just not attractive. Like <laughs> none of their feet are attractive. It's like gnarly. Uh, <laughs> I just love how Tubbs just keeps pestering Valerie until eventually he gets back in. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's like, oh, this is all, I just feel sorry for you. <laughs> and you know what? You're going to leave anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. See? <laughs> if they see, ki- see kids, if a woman tells you no, just keep going until you wear her down. Yeah, so you're worried out and you're completely annoying, and she's like, yeah, okay, I give in. As the montage ends, we see Sonny going to the airport. He's getting ready to head back home. Who knows what's going to happen with this Margaret character. I think Melissa almost dropped a couple hints that maybe she'll pop back up in the future. But she's at least around for them to bone down at least one more time before oh, he heads back. Bone down. <laughs> that sounds so gross. Before he heads back to Miami. And then we see at the last minute, Tubbs comes running up to get a ticket to go back to Miami. Because he's Crockett done is- boning down. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you see, like, after they do the love scene and Tubbs is sleeping and Val's just sitting there with her eyes open, like, she's got this look like she's seriously regretting. Yeah, she's she like, makes. why did I do this? <laughs> there was so much foot action. I'm not into that. I don't know. <laughs> I just think it's amazing. There's no repercussions for blowing up buildings and shooting down helicopters and killing gangs of people. They just go back to Miami like everything's fine. And even Dina, who is in surgery and critical condition, shows up with just an arm in a sling. Like, ha-ha. <laughs> and that's the final scene we see. Like, things are basically back to normal. And that's my final t- takeaway on this episode. It's like, everyone got killed in New York. Everyone back in Miami. Everyone. The yeah. entire city's dead now. <laughs> everyone back in Miami is, everyone is fine. So we can actually kind of pretend like this episode never happened. Yeah, exactly. Like, we're going to go yeah, right And next year, we'll save Chicago. 
<laughs> the only thing that caught my eye at the very end of this episode is the look that Crockett and Gina were giving each other as he's on the phone. Crockett was, he seemed to be very happy. Obviously, he's happy that Gina's okay. He wandered but, guy. No, <laughs> but they had, they had a nice longing look at each other as this episode ended. Unfortunately, as much as I would love to say that longing look continues on, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Point. So yeah, that still, concludes no this episode. Let's, um, <laughs> as, as John mentioned, there was a lot of music in the first half. But let's see how much music made it into this second part of the episode. Hit me with what you got. I, I don't remember it. None, Any of the music. none of the music really stood out to me. So I'm, I'm very interested to see what made it into this, uh, into this episode. Thankfully, it was not quite the same task as last week's uh, 10 songs but there were still five songs in the second half of this episode we're going to start with one that should sound very familiar called you belong to the city by blend drop it should sound familiar because i talked about it a little bit when they played it earlier in part one it is actually the only song in the episode used twice hmm, that seems very it was written specifically the opposite for vice. Of my, normal miami vice for them to use a song twice <clears throat> yeah yeah so but i mean it was written specifically for Vice and for specifically for this Vice episode. You Belong to the Cities probably out of all the gl- solo stuff Glenn Fry did, probably is the most recognizable song of all this solo stuff. And even though it was written specifically for my Vice, it still peaked at number two at the time behind Starships. We built this city. Not quite as good as building a city on rock and roll, but, <laughs> you know... What I think is funny is when I'm, I was looking up stuff about the song, they go, all the instruments were performed by Fry. And then at, at the very end, in smaller print, except the saxophone and drums. So he played guitar. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, basically, he performed the song on his solo stuff, but he also used to perform it with the Eagles until 2005, in which he decided to stop performing it with the Eagles. I don't know. But this song and Jan Hammer's Miami Vice theme helped make the Miami Vice soundtrack the best-selling soundtrack of all time. I used to joke about the Miami Vice soundtrack and joke about how how can this album be a number one album. Starting to listen, try to actually hear the music that they chose to put on there. I'm starting to understand it. Our next song is Good Girl by Go West on the album Go West. Go West was an English pop duo that sold well, uh, sold pretty well in the United Kingdom and New Zealand mostly, and a little bit in the U.S. Uh, a little bit later into into their career. It was made up of the of band members Peter Cox and Richard Drummy. Not too many interesting stuff. They had a pretty good pop run going. Cox, Peter Cox would also. Uh, have a solo career or release some solo records. I think what did catch my eye was that in 2003, Peter Cox would replace a contestant on the UK reality show Reborn in the USA hmm. and would end up becoming the favorite to win, but he would be voted off when he forgot the lyrics to Nora Jones' hit. <laughs> The next song we have is Windswept by Brian Ferry. Brian Ferry, man, he deserves a reality show. I I will tell you that. So Brian Ferry was the lead singer of Roxy Music, which was apparently a UK band that was actually pretty popular. The song Windswept actually features Pink Floyd's David Gilmore on guitar. Mm -hmm. Mm. But the song didn't do quite as well as the other singles off of his album, Boys and Girls. So, Ferry, with his solo work and his rusty music work, he actually sold over 30 million records. Damn. You know, um, and this is the second artist one in the world is, that I, I, I hadn't heard of before. Like, I don't know. I've never, never heard yeah. of when they, you yeah. know, they sold so many records. Like, what? <laughs> And I actually looked at Roxy Music, the bands, like what their catalog was, and I didn't recognize anything. I didn't recognize anything. So what I did take out of it was that he was kind of a big deal, I guess, in England. And he he dated a girl who would go on to date and marry David Bowie. He uh, Same thing, he would date and think at one point be married to a woman who would leave him for Mick Jagger. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. 
He has four kids, which, by the way, his four kids' names are Otis, Isaac, Tara, and Merlin. <laughs> yeah, the last one, a wizard. Oh, my God, those four kids. <laughs> So, another fun name. Would all appear on his 2010 solo project. So, I'm just saying, like, this is like a reality show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, just perfect. Kids are getting arrested. They're getting kicked out of college. Their dad's banging ex models. <laughs> Everything's there. I mean, even his last two marriages, one, one wife cheated on him, and then the other one was a girlfriend that he had that people thought he was sleeping with while he was married. Damn. So apparently Brian Ferry is pretty damn famous for me not knowing who the hell he is. Yeah, he's living a life I think a lot of people want, even though no one <laughs> no knows, one knows who, who he is. is. <laughs> Our next song is Rubber Mirror by Liquid Liquid. The 1981 song uh, by the dance electro punk band. band consisted of Scott Harley, Richard McGuire, Sal Fitz... Prince Zapato and Dennis Young, they were together from 1980 to 1983 and then got back together in 2008 for a tour and uh, even were on Jimmy Fallon uh, uh, during that tour. Mm. So what's interesting about them is that they're, so they did like electro, electro dance music. One of their songs, one of their big songs was sampled by Grandmaster Mel, uh, Melly Mel. Oh, his song "White Lines Don't Do It," mm -hmm. and then they they were also sampled by the Sugar Hill Gang, but not. Uh, but the Sugar Hill Gang didn't ask for permission, so they sued the Sugar Hill Gang and won, but, but couldn't collect because the Sugar Hill Gang went into receivership shortly afterwards. Mm -hmm. Wow! So, oh, so so they at least made music that other musicians love. Yeah, they just apparently they just had a hell of a time getting people to pay them for it. <laughs> because in 1997 they were trying to release their albums, and both the, there were two record companies who were trying to do this. Both of them failed to to do this because both of the record labels went bankrupt before they successfully re-released them. So it wasn't until 2008 that they got together and toured and actually got a little bit of press appearing on Jimmy Fallon and stuff. But for the most part, they really didn't make any money for what they did. <laughs> the last song we have is Take Me Home by Phil Collins off the al album No Jacket Required. We've talked about Phil Collins a bunch, and I could get into his fascination with the Alamo and how he has a collection <laughs> just to try and find something interesting to talk about. Instead, I will bring up the fact that Collins had Sting do the backup vocals on that song and also featured Peter Gabriel on it as well. The song did as well in the U.S. as some of the others, like Sue Studio, off of that album. Fantastic song. Yes. But it, it still ended up uh, making number seven on the charts, and it was the closing theme for the WWF's Saturday Night Main Event in the late 80s for several years. I'm always happy when a Phil Collins song makes it into the episode, so I have no complaints on that. I mean, the only other thing about it is that the music video is just different clips of that on tour performing and at the very end of the song he kind of walks in the house where his then wife asks him where he's been and he lists all the cities and she goes you've been down at the pub haven't you <laughs> <Really laughs>, <really laughs. laughs and that's your music <laughs> well uh this has been a long a two-part episode so let's head over and talk about our final thoughts on this episode and get ready to get past our feature-length episode and on to the rest of season two all right melissa how about you kick us off this week what are your final thoughts on this episode of miami vice season two episode one the prodigal son but just the second half part two of this episode final thoughts would be that i don't think it was needed for part two they probably could have got it all in in one episode but i think they felt like because it was the season premiere they needed to like kick it off with a bang because they were so popular at that time so they went with it and made it a movie but i think it didn't really need to be that long <laughs> <laughs> that's my opinion <laughs> it was not my favorite episode when it aired originally either i didn't really particularly like it but like i told you previously 
I don't really like Valerie, so that kind of weighs on that part too. I don't really, I don't care for her. I don't like her. Per- I don't like her uh, character that much. Well, I would vehemently disagree with the Valerie mm-hmm. talk there. <laughs> Valerie is one of my favorite characters so far in the show, and I will say I agree with that. It. It's too long. They had so many fillers that were happening to stretch it out to be a two a, an extended episode, basically a two part episode. Um, I think it starts off solid. I like the fact that it it buttons up at the end. We're not going to have any carryover left over from New York. We just kind of dipped in to kick off season two, especially because season one ended kind of anticlimactic. So it was like a, it was like a big. This is a big swing at the beginning of season two. Miami Vice is really coming to their own. That's really popular on TV. I'm overall. I'm happy with this episode. I'm really, I, I had a lot of fun with it. There was some expected twists and turns. There was nothing new that came out of this. It was it was a classic Miami Vice episode. John, what are your final thoughts? I, I think I agree with the fact that it was just too long. It was just too many guest stars, too many different storylines. I think if you just do the Colombian storyline and you cut out everything else, that it was a great, ep- that would have been a great episode standalone by itself. But adding in Gene Simmons' character on a boat for no reason and adding in the CEO corporate spy angle, you know, I think it just, it was just a bunch of wasted filler. I'm used to seeing TV shows do this when they do like the three episode event, you know, and by the time you get to the third episode, they've had so much filler that they almost kind of rush at the end, trying to rush the rest of the ending in there. <clears throat> oh. Because they spent so long trying to make sure they cover everything with this guest and with this guest star, you know? And I just kind of feel like if it had just been a single one-hour standalone episode about the Colombians, you took all the other noise out, it would have been a, would have been a better functional episode, in my opinion. I agree. And it still, it was a lot of fun, and I think it was a great, it's a great start to season two. And I know there's so many great episodes that are going to come this season two, and um, Melissa's just hanging on to get to season three. Season that's three her. is my favorite season. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed the show. We would love to hear your feedback. You can email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Go check out our website, goalwiththeheat.com. Click on about, or go to subscribe, see all the ways you can subscribe to the show. Click on about, you can see all the ways you can can contact us including twitter facebook tumblr you can find these episodes on stitcher and youtube so depending on your platform that you choose to listen to the episodes you can find us pretty much anywhere we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next week bye fellas. bye